we can begin sir yeah we can begin Atina kaita ko hui hui mai nei e mihi ana ki nga grassroots institutes a kotina e takui mihi ki nga tanga te finua o nga rohi nei. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge everyone gathered here today, uh, especially those, uh, especially our hosts, the grassroots institute. I uh, also acknowledge all the indigenous communities uh, of the areas or the rohi in which all of you gathered here today reside. Nō reira te katoa. It is my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you today a friend and a colleague, Associate Professor Simon Lambert. Simon is of Tuhoi and Ngāti Ruapani descent. Uh, his master's examined environmental vulnerability in the Pacific and his PhD was on small-scale Māori horticulture. Uh, following the 2011 earthquakes in Ōtautahi Christchurch, New Zealand, Simon's research uh, focused on disaster risk reduction for Indigenous communities with a particular interest in urban Indigenous groups. Uh, as you can tell, Simon has a variety of interests in his research, uh, and it is this variety of research interest areas that makes Simon a phenomenal researcher. It, it allows him to look across disciplines and across uh, organizations and countries and communities to pull together ideas that others might not necessarily grasp or make connections between. Uh, Simon has a wealth of experience in the Indigenous disaster risk space, uh, and you're very lucky, and I'm privileged to introduce him today uh, to have him talk to us about engaging uh, in movements to address historical inequities uh, and reassert self-determination in the development of Indigenous peoples. Uh, again, uh, welcome you all, acknowledge uh, your communities and uh, no mai haere mai, Simon, I will hand it over to you. Kia ora. Kia ora Mel. Uh, thanks very much for that. Always uh, humbling to be introduced amongst uh, such company. Um, I know very few of you, uh, and unfortunately, given the restrictions of COVID, uh, unlikely uh, to be able to meet any of you very anytime soon. Thank you, Dr. Hazrat, for organizing this, and to the others behind you supporting uh, the Grassroots Institute. It's no easier to organize people, least of all academics, uh, just because we're online. Um, the old saying, it's like herding cats. But kia ora koutou, thank you for attending today. Uh, and I'll just run through some of the insights that I have um, learned from my research and offer some uh, sort of pointers to the future. Uh, and also um, sort of really challenge you to start thinking about how to better support indigenous peoples uh, in disaster risk reduction. Uh, in environmental management and health and education. In fact, across all the areas um, that our peoples are interested in. So uh, as Melanie said in uh, her introduction, um, my tribal connections are to two tribes called Tuhoi and Ngatirupani and a tribal territory is called Waikere Moana. That's a picture of Waikere Moana, the lake. They're a very beautiful part of, uh, of Aotearoa and he's in a very beautiful part of uh, the world. Uh, when I look at an environment like this with my academic hat on, as I'm sure many of you can do right now, where you have mountains and, and uh, jagged bluffs like that, you have seismic activity. New Zealand is very well known for its earthquakes, volcanic activity. We have lost many people over the years to those hazards and we will continue to experience those hazards. It is my hope that we uh, do not continue to lose uh, as many people. In fact, hopefully we lose ideally zero. I'm uh, currently Associate Professor of Indigenous Studies at the University uh, of Saskatchewan. I want to acknowledge the people of uh, Treaty 6 and the Métis whose homeland that is. Uh, a very different environment. Um, it's not exactly flat. When people say the prairies are flat, they are undulating. Uh, but we have different hazards there. Um, uh, storms are very heavy. Uh, winters down to minus 45, can be plus 30 in summer, so huge range. Uh, there are droughts, there are thunderstorms, there are floods, there are wildfires. Uh, there are hazards, there are Indigenous peoples who have uh, grown uh, and developed 
as peoples in those territories and have their own understanding, appreciation of them. So just a, a brief overview of what I'm going to run through today, talk a little bit about Indigenous peoples and our communities, touch on uh, some definitions uh, on disasters, and then walk through um, a number of case studies, and then talk about programs in place now, uh, and, and trying to look to some more secure future for not just Indigenous peoples, but for uh, all of uh, humanity. Uh, the artwork there in the corner may have grabbed your attention, which was its intent. It's a series of, um, of beaded artworks by uh, an Indigenous artist in Saskatchewan uh, called Ruth Cuthand. And all these uh, diseases and the viruses have had very, very negative impacts on, on Indigenous peoples. Our peoples have suffered more uh, to pandemics than non-Indigenous peoples. But first of all, who is Indigenous? I have here a list of definitions from the United Nations, and you can read through them there. I won't talk to them much other than to point out uh, the United Nations and its wisdom has left uh, the definition somewhat open. The last uh, clause there, other relevant factors. It's a political, uh, politically fraught area. Um, but we can generally agree it is around uh, ancestral lands, uh, connections to the original occupants of lands and territories, culture and language and beliefs and systems of organization. Uh, and one thing I will say is that uh, we have a number of uh, modern features in common, uh, principally framed as being subject to colonization. Here is a, a, a stirring uh, image of indigenous peoples uh, of Canada, diverse, vibrant cultures, uh, but let's not ignore uh, the plain, uh, terrible history, the ongoing racism and marginalization of indigenous communities uh, in um, a country now called Canada, across the place we often call North America, across all of the Americas, and in fact around uh, most of the world, indigenous communities are marginalized, discriminated against, uh, and often uh, uh, violently oppressed. So I want to acknowledge that that is happening, uh, it's ongoing. Uh, and, uh, and really, if you take nothing else out of my talk today, be aware that we are still fighting, we're still uh, here, uh, and we're still actively agitating for uh, a seat at the table, uh, a voice in the debates, uh, and empowerment as is our right. And we often talk about Indigenous knowledge when we talk about any Indigenous issue, particularly environmental issues. Uh, I have a definition there from a colleague of mine, Simone at the aid, uh, University of Florida in Gainesville. You can just read through that quickly. So again, very encompassing and can and absolutely does include the ability to assimilate and understand new discoveries, new innovations, new knowledges, Western science included. Uh, I emphasize there indigenous knowledges. All our knowledges are diverse, like all our communities are diverse. They have common features, but what is relevant and what is indigenous to one uh, region, one part of the world, one community may not be relevant or valid in the next community. Right, so understand that again, that you cannot just learn uh, the superficial understanding of indigenous knowledge in one community and then expect that to translate, transfer to another community. We do have uh, the benefit of historical data, landscape hazards. It gives us insight also into human environment interactions. Right, how are we going to live with these hazards? How does one live in a seismically active landscape? How does one live with seasonal hazards, cyclones, tornadoes, ice storms, and so on? And I'd argue, and it's a terrible word sometimes, efficiencies, but once we know more about indigenous communities, their cultures, we can have a more effective engagement, uh, including emergency response, disaster management, and so on, because you understand how the community 
wants to work, who its leaders are, what is important, what is not so important, what their priorities are. The challenge, of course, is how to actually empower our communities so we can frame our own disaster risk reduction strategies. Now, communities are increasingly diverse. Uh, they're gender diverse, there's diverse sexual identities, diverse beliefs. Uh, and we're also increasingly urban. Māori are about 85% urban. Uh, and around the world, other Indigenous communities likewise rapidly moving to urban areas. A number of reasons for that. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult to maintain lifestyles in isolated rural areas. There is the attraction of bright lights, big cities. Cities are exciting. I like cities. Uh, and um, the opportunities for employment, for education, health services, and so on. And, and that pull is going to continue to draw, particularly, I think, our young people into urban areas. One thing I want to emphasize here is that when it comes to responding to emergencies, responding to disasters, Communities are your first responders. You're more likely to be pulled out of a collapsed house by your neighbour than you are by a trained a professional. And we see this all the time with all sorts of disasters and emergencies. People help each other. They help their friends, their neighbours and their family members. So a number of images there. Um, you'll be familiar with them. Uh, it's not the exact events the broad thrust of uh, how hazards translate into disasters. Um, and of course, now with a lot of modern events, we have often quite horrific footage filmed by people on their phones, uh, mobile devices, transmitted through social media. Quite shocking, can be quite traumatic, but we do have a wealth of imagery, a wealth of data. And we know that these events are um, continuing to impact on society. And whether there's more or less events, we certainly see more intense storms, greater uh, frequency of certain events, particularly those related to climate, hydrological events. And of course, we're living in a time of pandemic. Um, I've seen a number of references in presentations and in the news media and so on of a post-COVID society. I want to uh, stress that I don't think we're through uh, the pandemic yet. I know our communities, are still somewhat fearful and people are still being, many people are still being very, very careful. And for good reason, the risks are still there. Here are the uh, differences on, on cue, some sound effects, first responder on the job. So here are the definitions of disaster from Public Safety Canada. They like to quantify things, of course, but emphasize there, events of historical significance, and things that uh, significantly damage or interrupt normal processes for a community so that that community cannot recover on its own. So hold that definition close. Again, uh, from the huge administrative bureaucracy of, of Public Safety Canada, these hazards categorised. You see there, uh, beginning airplane crashes, marine accidents, motor vehicle crashes, train derailments. These are significant events in many societies uh, and result in a, a huge number of deaths, particularly motor vehicle crashes. The next category there, astronomical asteroids. Okay, maybe we can dismiss those most days, but um, we know Hollywood hasn't dismissed that. That's another feature of life on planet Earth, whirling space matter. Dam failure and structural collapse, increasing risk in some uh, areas, diseases, all the different types of disease that we might see. Earthquakes, tsunami, volcanoes, fires, hazardous materials, nuclear accidents, power outage, outages. Um, I want to acknowledge at the moment those people suffering in the heat wave across India and other regions. Um, it, it kills people. It doesn't quite have the gripping, immediate, visual attraction that the media wants to run with, like an earthquake would or a tsunami, but they, these events kill significant numbers of people, as can a power outage in the middle of winter. Uh, the last category is air terrorism. 
um, interesting and a number of categories there. Uh, also, I want to sensitize you to the fact that many Indigenous communities, as they pursue their uh, rights, um, their inherent rights, their treasury rights, their Indigenous rights, are often and, and increasingly seem to me to be framed as terrorists, as a risk to the normal functioning of the state. And many leaders have been assassinated, oppressed, journalists have been uh, spied on, uh, surveilled. Now, young people are um, rightly quite frightened of many state uh, forces. A series of graphs just to run through some of the visuals, some of the data as it's visualized. Um, number of uh, events seems to have increased through uh, the last century, seems to have plateaued or, or tailed off. Number of deaths, again, seems to uh, have trailed off over the last century. Although what we do see is certain communities, and again, I would say indigenous communities to the forefront of this vulnerability, are uh, still sidelined, marginalised, and particularly in those urban environments that many of us now live in, increasingly uh, suffering from hazards, emergencies, and disasters. Across the various events there, uh, drought and flood uh, claim huge numbers of people's lives. And the green uh, dots across the middle there, extreme weather. I think there were around 600 people killed in British Columbia and Canada last summer in a heat wave. Many of them, um, you know, obviously people without air conditioning in their houses, right? Generally poorer people, more at risk than wealthier people. And news coverage of disasters, there's an old saying uh, out of the media, I think it came from a journalist in New York, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, and, you know, right down the bottom there now, I, I suspect this has somewhat changed in the last two years. But certainly droughts, food shortages, famines, um, landslides and so on don't quite get the attention that an earthquake does or a volcanic eruption or a large fire or a large storm. And these things are expensive. Um, some large scale events in 2017, 2011, which included um, the uh, Eastern Japan earthquake and the Christchurch earthquake. Uh, and the cost, for, again, for some communities disproportionately weighted against them. And many of our poorer communities aren't insured. If they suffer a significant loss, that's often a permanent loss. They do not manage to make that good. We use this term vulnerability. I think I've used it myself already. We've often seen this uh, label attached to Indigenous peoples, and it's often come about through colonisation discourse, social Darwinism. We weren't meant to survive modernity. We were in the way. We were going to be bred out. We were going to be eradicated. We were going to be erased in some way. Uh, and so the negative impacts of colonisation I've already touched on, the marginalisation, discrimination, racism that many of our communities face. And we're often located in places not of our choosing, in hazardous areas. Uh, even in the urban settlements tend to be in those areas which have more pollution, including noise pollution, uh, unstable slopes, more traffic, uh, more toxic substances and so on. We also have this word resilience. Now, it's often seen as the inverse or the flip side of vulnerability. It's got a bit of a history in academia. Uh, there's a history of it coming out of psychology, where it's looking at individual strengths. Uh, we see in engineering, and we see engineering a lot in disaster management, the ability of a system to absorb shocks before it needs to alter in some way. And likewise, in ecology, and those of you who have been informed by socio-ecological system studies, the ability of an ecosystem to stabilize itself following a disturbance. All these uh, contributions from these disciplines are valid, all very, very useful in understanding disaster risk reduction. And there is, uh, again, from the Emergency Management Framework for Canada, a brief uh, definition of disaster risk reduction, BRR. Reducing disaster risk through systemic, systematic efforts to analyze and manage causal factors of disasters. 
And there is the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, who are hosting the latest global platform in Bali uh, in the third week of May. And I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. So what does disaster risk, disaster risk reduction require? Information, data, monitoring, uh, dedicated institutions, uh, well thought out, comprehensive strategy, resourcing, and commitment. Uh, I see a lot of research proposals. Uh, I'm aware of a lot of programs. To be honest, I would say as a researcher, uh, we've got enough research. We know what we need to do. What we're actually lacking is commitment and leadership. And if we're going to research anything, I would love to see how we could in some way bring about better political economic conditions to reduce the risk of disasters. The picture there was from uh, one of the many conferences I've been to. Uh, it's a French invention. It's a solid table designed to uh, be sheltered under in the event of a building collapse, earthquake or so on. And I draw attention there in the, in the centre, a little to the top there, you'll see a bottle of wine tucked into its own little clip there. Marvellous addition to um, disaster management from the French. I should have some chocolate as well. But what roles and rights are there for Indigenous peoples? Given that we are often marginalised and excluded from any of these debates. So arguably, we would see colonisation as the disaster. It's undermined our resilience, our economic security. It's limited our ability to plan and develop and, and locate our settlements and it's kept our voices out of the relevant debate. We can see colonisation as disaster risk creation instead of disaster risk reduction. And we still see this sort of discourse appear in some of the debates, political debates, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, you'll hear them in Canada, the US, in fact, around the world, that non-Indigenous peoples are doing indigenous peoples a favor, civilizing them, bringing them into this modern world, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I don't buy it. Uh, I think the evidence is pretty clear that colonization has been an absolute disaster for indigenous peoples, and we're still recovering, still responding to that. I mentioned the United Nations, so here's a, a brief history uh, of some of the agreements and strategies that they have implemented to bring about a safer world. So a number of large events in the 60s and 70s drew international attention. There was the United Nations Disaster Relief Office established in the early 70s. The 1990s was the International Decade for Natural Disaster Reduction, Yokohama Strategy, then the Hyogo Framework for Action, which has a single mention of, quote, relevant traditional and indigenous knowledge and cultural heritage. So we often see indigenous positions merged into wider cultural heritage uh, concerns or biodiversity and environmental concerns. And of course, in 2007, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The Sendai Framework uh, is the latest uh, agreement by which we are seeking uh, to implement effective disaster risk reduction. Two sections uh, mention Indigenous knowledges, And I'll come back to this feature again, that we don't assume that Indigenous knowledges have all the answers. We absolutely see our knowledges as being able to complement uh, disaster science uh, and contribute to developing and implementing relevant plans and mechanisms. It will be about collaboration. And three uh, features that keep coming out in the debates around sustainable development as disaster risk, risk reduction, the idea that many communities have vulnerable livelihoods and increasingly vulnerable because of climate change. We see huge threats to biodiversity, the decline of ecosystems, and we see a huge amount of unplanned development. Communities forced or defaulting to locating within an area of risk. 
floodplains, for instance, or very close to the coast, or on very steep slopes on the outskirts of cities where there is often intense rainfall. And this quote from the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights about treaties. So many Indigenous peoples have their own treaties. I've mentioned Treaty 6, uh, where the University of Saskatchewan is located here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. For Māori and the Crown, it was the Treaty of Waitangi, signed in 1840. So we still have these constitutional spaces in which our voices uh, need to be heard, and our voices likewise carry on into discussions on disaster risk reduction strategies. So, quick summary there, I mean, basically, Indigenous communities and disaster managers will have opportunities to utilise Indigenous knowledges in disaster risk reduction. We are talking about, rather than a top-down process, a bottom-up where communities are brought into the discussion and debate and are empowered in their own disaster risk reduction strategies. And the UN strategies, Sendai framework now, are part of the solution. They can guide and monitor states. So I just want to run through um, a number of case studies. And as Melanie mentioned in the introduction, uh, I started researching how these events impact on my community in uh, 2011, when uh, we had a significant earthquake uh, in Christchurch, uh, 185 deaths. Um, quite a number of them were international visitors. Uh, it's, you know, very popular tourist destination. And it was a time of day when uh, people were, were in buildings, were out on the streets, uh, and so on. I'll also talk a little bit about wildfires. Uh, people might forget that the year of COVID, a couple of years ago now, uh, actually began with mega fires in California uh, and Australia. And the images were, again, quite shocking. And of course, I uh, can't really talk about disaster um, science and management and risk reduction these days without talking about. COVID-19, so I'll touch on that as well. And a little bit of light relief. Um, the landscape of New Zealand features in a number of uh, Hollywood blockbusters. Many of you, I'm sure, are Lord of the Rings uh, fans, as I am, uh, although to be honest, I never quite pictured it being set in uh, my backyard. It's kind of meant to be a somewhat more distant location. I always framed it somehow as looking a little bit like English countryside, as I'm sure Tolkien, the author did, but those mountains, you don't get mountains like that. And also Himalayas, the Andes, uh, the Alps uh, in, in Europe, you don't get mountains like that without seismic activity. So February the 22nd and 2011, a uh, significant event and that there is a picture taken from the Port Hills by uh, a woman uh, just there, you know, time and place, got that snap in. And it's emotional to me because under that dust there, there's a lot of pain and fear uh, and suffering. As I say, 185 deaths, most of them in uh, one building. Uh, and a lot of technical data. Um, and of course, I've mentioned engineers, uh, seismologists, uh, geologists, physical geographers. Uh, there's a lot of expertise which comes to bear in these sort of events and just some of the data there and it's all useful i i do draw on it uh the building on the left there, the cpv building 115 deaths uh, uh, took place in and around uh there pretty shocking And the impact, so other data, uh, we often split data between quantitative and qualitative. And there's all sorts of numbers that started to, to be gathered that uh, reflected how people were responding and recovering or not recovering to this event. Gambling was up, drinking was up, people who hadn't smoked in 20 years were buying a packet of cigarettes, relationships, many relationships um, ended. Uh, again, uh, 
you never quite know how you are going to respond or how an event is going to, to impact you. I'm sure a lot of you have learned something about yourselves uh, and your relationships, your families, your colleagues and that through uh, the last two years of, of COVID-19. And again, that is still a work in progress. There's always a little bit of, of humour, uh, often quite dark humour in uh, events like this. I think almost anywhere you travel, any airport now has a keep calm and carry on t-shirt or variation thereof. Uh, and one of the more challenging things for a lot of people, particularly our older people, was the fact that they lost their, we lost uh, waste water management, lost the sewage lines. Uh, and so people were often having to use portaloos. And you'll be familiar with this, you know, this design. Uh, and, you know, looking at it, you probably may feel like I do, a, sen a certain sense of dread. You may see these at a rock concert or, you know, somewhere, and you'll see these in disaster zones, particularly in urban uh, disasters. Many older people were very, very reluctant to use these, or they would use these late at night when they thought people weren't, weren't watching. Who wants to know when you're going to the bathroom? All right. It's, it's again, one of those things that disaster managers are, are more aware of than most, and something also when you work with any community, you have to understand the sensitivities and some of the cultural restrictions around a simple thing, uh, a, a simple, you know, simple but somehow still fraught event like that. Data, very, very difficult to get good data on indigenous peoples. The number of reasons for that, again, it's the history of colonization has led to the statistical frameworks that we've inherited and that we try to use. Uh, very difficult to plan for indigenous communities if you don't have good statistical data, good demographic data. There's a lot of constraints. We did have good school enrollment data uh, through the Christchurch earthquakes. So here are um, uh, school enrollments in the uh, months after the event. Christchurch city in the middle, Māori school enrollments are in blue. So what we see is our children and our families were the most mobile, moved south to Kaikoura and Hurunui districts uh, that are mentioned, uh, graphed in the left there, and in big numbers, percentage-wise, actually proportionally we moved. And I can't talk about data without also mentioning Indigenous data sovereignty. We are actually asserting sovereign rights over data that is sourced from our communities, sourced from our territories, or in other ways, uh, stuff that is appropriated from our activities, our actions, our processes, our culture. Uh, Canada is starting to grapple with that as a result of New Zealand. I mention it because you'll all be in, in different research and work settings, professional lives. If and when and where you work with Indigenous peoples, understand that data and also particularly digital data is one of those things that we are seeking control of. The Māori response included a number of Māori organisations and institutions, Māori Wardens, Māori Women's Welfare League, the local tribe Naitahu kicked in with a huge, uh, very efficient, very well-structured response, and North Island tribes, so this is taking place in the South Island of Aotearoa, North Island tribes sent their own people, sent support, sent supplies, not just for Māori, but the networks meant that we were perhaps more aware of where those supplies could be better distributed by the local tribe. And there in blue is the national state emergency response framework. There's the Ministry of Civil Defence and Emergency Management, Crisis Management Centre, Regional Civil Defence, Emergency Services. There's your ambulance, your fire service, urban search and rescue, which have a connection to the United Nations, police, the military, international um, emergency managers, first responders came from around the world, Australia in particular, US, Singapore, all around the world, and want to acknowledge the support. These things overwhelmed New Zealand's resources. And there in brown is the Māori Recovery Network, response slash recovery, the two phases blur. And 
I won't uh, bore you with the details. Suffice to say that Māori organisations and institutions worked through cultural connections and understanding to support local tribe and each other, and also when and where they can, work in, of course, with the national government, who controlled most of what was going on. But nothing exists in isolation these days. 2011, many economies were still recovering from the global financial crisis, 2008 to 2009. And I learned a great deal about the insurance sector during all this, in particular the reinsurance sector, though well, I didn't even know this was a thing. But of course, insurance companies, they, don't, they want to insure their risks. There's a reinsurance market dominated by the big European companies, Swiss Re, Munich Re, you may be familiar with the names. Uh, interestingly, I think they all meet in Monte Carlo. I don't want to read too much into that, but... Uh, and New Zealand is a small country, five million people, small economy. We are heavily reliant on exports uh, and also international businesses and tourism, all of which have taken a big hit from the financial crisis and the earthquake. Christchurch in particular suffered greatly from a lack of tourists in the South Island for quite some time. It's a main entry point for international and domestic visitors. So our response was immediate and the communities were responding. It was culturally framed. We had cultural values that we adhered to. We looked to and supported our elders. We looked to and supported our women, our children. Uh, and we also saw the local tribe Naitahu significantly empowered through subsequent rebuild plans and strategies. And that's a very, very interesting example. So keep that in mind that when and where the rights of the local people are acknowledged and they're formally integrated into rebuild recovery plans, they will actually become stronger and benefit everybody else around them. So I'm just acknowledging Teruna or Naitahu, it was the Iwi authority, the local tribal authority on which, uh, on whose lands the disaster occurred. And then life just goes on. There was another earthquake uh, a few years after that, uh, COVID-19 of course, now we have, you know, front page news everywhere as the cost of living increases and inflation. And uh, lurking behind it all is, is climate change. Uh, and for New Zealand, sea level rise, as in many other countries, is going to be a significant challenge. So a report just out the other day, uh, areas of the country are subsiding and are going to be subject to quicker inundation, uh, king tides, storms, uh, and so on. And a lot of our lifelines, our infrastructure run along the coast and there are coastal communities, huge amount of property wealth and a lot of Māori communities likewise located near coastal resources. Historically, they were uh, abundant um, food gathering areas. So nothing stays still for very long. And wildfires, uh, I mentioned the year of COVID started with these mega fires in uh, the US and in Australia. In uh, the Arctic, we see an increasing number of wildfires. You wouldn't think that there would be a risk of, of wildfire in the Arctic, but we're seeing the data come through now, Canada and elsewhere. That, yes, actually, these places can and do burn and are doing so at an increasing rate. Uh, I want to acknowledge a student and friend of mine, Brady Highway, who is an Indigenous firefighter. He's leading uh, a strategy bringing in um, wildfire management into Indigenous Guardians leadership programs. And again, the idea of cultural understanding of the hazard. So yes, we need the technology. Helicopters are very useful in these events. But we also have fire as a responsibility, as medicine for the land and for people. Cultural burning as a sovereign right. And I'm drawing on the research of Dr. Amy Christensen, uh, who's a Métis researcher. And she talks about the relational worldview that Indigenous peoples bring to wildfire. In Australia, in Canada, and elsewhere, we now see this cultural knowledge of cultural burning, of fire stewardship, coming back into the conversation as firefighters, 
uh, as land managers, as political leaders, see the risk of increasing wildfire, we need to somehow find a way to reduce the risk, including reducing the fuel load that is in forests that are prevented from burning. So the standard Western approach was to fight fire, to ban it, stop indigenous peoples using those resources, using their cultural burning techniques. And we've seen the fuel load build up to levels now where definitely when it catches on fire and these things always seem to catch on fire. Those fires are now called mega fires of a size and an extent that you just simply must flee for your life. You cannot fight them. So we have the right to manage our environments and the knowledge is to do so in a sustainable manner. We absolutely accept the need to collaborate with other knowledges, but we demand an ethical engagement, respectful relationships, informed consent, and where relevant, ownership and control of data. Data sovereignty for Indigenous peoples will be something you will be hearing more and more about. And now just to touch on COVID-19, and really is COVID-19 any different from any previous pandemic for Indigenous peoples? Certainly it's disrupted global supply chains more. And certainly it seems to still be good. But if we look back in the history of pandemics, Indigenous peoples have been hammered by these things and they are often several years of duration and they do disrupt economic security. They do disrupt and destroy knowledge transmission as we lose our elders. Right? So in many ways, it's, it's the same song sheet. We do see some different things now though. So a couple of examples. Uh, we saw iwi uh, and community, tribal and community leaders here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, setting up roadblocks during the worst of the COVID in New Zealand when there was uh, quite a lot of restriction on movements. And we saw community leaders on the roads saying, actually, you know what? Locals only trying to keep uh, uh, sightseers, people just looking to get out of the city away from these vulnerable communities. And there was often support from the local police to do so. Right? So I see a significant change where now state authorities see the benefits of indigenous peoples taking over some of the management responsibilities in a disaster or an emergency, providing again those efficiencies that, again, let's be honest, Governments are all too eager to seek. You've got to show them a good Excel spreadsheet. And likewise, in Saskatchewan, community leaders setting up curfews and roadblocks and trying to keep the worst risk factors out, keep the numbers down, keep the movements down. Often isolated communities, one or two roads in, one or two roads out, but still. Um, the virus did manage to find its way into most communities and the losses in some communities have been pretty significant. So we are vulnerable to ongoing health emergencies, overcrowded, and poor quality housing, poverty, comorbidities, we have heart conditions, we have diabetes, we have obesity, and of course we have racism. Etc. Etc. I mean, I've touched already on colonization as the uber disaster for our people. And there's not a lot of theory in disasters, but I sort of come up with this tongue in cheek law. Let's call it Lambert's law. In any given disaster, Indigenous communities will be more impacted than non Indigenous communities, and our recovery will be slower and less effective. If you look at the sum total of the empirical evidence presented in journal articles and presentations like this, that's one of the only conclusions you can come up with. So what are Indigenous peoples doing now? How do we promote resilience? I just want to touch on uh, three uh, programs. Uh, the first one, just quickly, it's just started. So uh, I'm on a program, uh, a research program with Drs. Caroline Tate and Lilia Yumagalova uh, at the University of Saskatchewan, sponsored by uh, Toronto Bank, TD Bank, Acknowledge them. And we're looking at transforming emergency response through gender and cultural safety. How can we have a better framework for evacuations if and when we have to evacuate communities? How can we acknowledge that our communities are diverse, 
and that people who are working in that evacuation need to have an understanding, need, need to have some extra skills to deal with that. And perhaps we actually empower the community and community leaders to enable that evacuation. And this is also coming under the umbrella of the International Indigenous Health Research and Training Centre, which is being hosted at Waikat, Dakota Nation, just south of Saskatoon and Saskatchewan. And there again, Indigenous territory, Indigenous control, Indigenous empowerment, the right and the ability to manage their own affairs. And really that's all that Indigenous peoples, Indigenous communities are asking for. So that's ongoing. Uh, I hope to be able to feed back uh, to this and other audiences once we have uh, completed that program. But also I want to touch on uh, a program in Aotearoa, New Zealand, looking at biosecurity, the protection of particularly our forests, uh, forest ecosystems from pests uh, and diseases. So Te Tiro Whakamātaki Foundation is a charitable organisation looking at uh, better biosecurity for Māori communities. And I was introduced by Melanie Mark Shadbolt, who is the uh, Chief Executive of Te Tiro Whakamātaki. So often known as the Māori Biosecurity Network. I'll let you read through uh, our blurb there. So ensuring that our communities are a part of the discussion about biosecurity in Aotearoa, New Zealand. To protect what is of importance to us. As is our right. I'll further let you read through our goals. And so the relevance of this to disaster risk reduction is we're increasingly looking at nature-based solutions to reduce the risk of disaster. Right? Supporting biodiversity, planting of particular species and crops to protect the land, to protect the soils, protecting the food chain, And Indigenous peoples, again, need to be to the forefront of nature-based solutions because so many of our peoples and our communities have actually had ancient connections to the land, to biodiversity. And that also includes cultural diversity. So this is also well known in ecology. Many of you will be familiar with that. And this is how we aim to do it. And I'd argue that many of these approaches are equally relevant to other communities, other societies, other research programs. Research, education, engagement, and advocacy. Because ultimately we need to change policy. We need to change legislation. We need to change the political economic structures of our regions, of our societies, arguably of the world. Couple of pictures there. That's Melanie Mark Shadbolt in the, uh, the top right. Uh, on the left there is a group. So we come together, we hui, we meet, we gather, we discuss and exchange information and we build networks. We build the bonds. The breakdown of relationships when we all just rely on online meetings, I think is, is pretty significant. And I will be back in a face-to-face -face conference very shortly and we'll talk about that next. And in the center there, our operations manager, Tommy Malcolm, a little bit of a cross between Aquaman and, and Stephen Adams and the MBA. So we've got a lot of talent in our communities that we can bring to issues such as biosecurity, such as flood management, such as wildfire and so on. And so the face-to-face -face, uh, conference that I hope to attend, Knockwood, uh, is taking place in a few weeks, well, a few, about 22, 23 days, in Bali, Indonesia, and it is the seventh global platform for disaster risk reduction 
And in that, we will be launching an international campaign for disaster risk reduction in Indigenous communities. These are what we see as the necessary outcomes. We need people to better understand our approaches to DRR. We need support for our communities to engage in relevant debates. And we need to integrate our experience into ongoing disaster risk reduction dialogues. I want to acknowledge John uh, C. Scott, uh, Clunkett and Haida, Ancestry, based in the US, Washington, uh, DC. He was a lobbyist there for many years in the disaster risk reduction space. He's actually put together uh, the agenda. Uh, looks like you won't be able to attend Bali, but uh, he is a mentor and a leader in the space for myself. I just want to acknowledge that without his efforts, this campaign would not actually be come to uh, be launched. So let me just conclude then. Uh, strategic disaster risk reduction is a right of Indigenous peoples. A sovereign right. Our knowledges are needed, but we accept all knowledges will be needed. This is bigger than just one community, one people, one state, one nation. Of interest, I think for everybody, is the time frame for addressing some of the most serious risks to climate change is much reduced. So the time to implement a truly inclusive disaster risk reduction approach at all scales is now. Again, acknowledging some of the other people that have spoken to these issues around the world. Dr. Siro Ugarte on the, on the left there, Todd Kuek on the right, Melanie in the centre there, Madeline Redfin, uh, who was Mayor of Akaluit and Nunavut for quite a number of years, uh, and also there another a speaker on Indigenous communities and their rights and abilities to manage the risk in faith-based organisations uh, as well who sponsor this particular event in Geneva. Kia ora koutou, that's all from me. Uh, Dr Hazrat, I'm not sure if, you, if we have time for questions and answers. I'm happy to, to take any uh, if I can. Yeah, thank you, sir. We will invite the questions from the audience, yes. Sure. Admin, please unmute. I'm not sure if there's anybody actually hoping or intending to get to Bali for the global platform. Uh, I want to ask a question. Sure. Um, my question is about uh, natural disasters. And uh, most of a lot of people think that the reason behind most of natural disasters are actually some of uh, humanity's actions, like uh, global overpollution or uh, some more uh, ecological actions, like what people do. What do you think about it? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, if you look at the transition from the Hyogo framework to the Sendai framework, you actually see a paradigm shift in those two agreements. So in Hyogo, they were looking at uh, the disasters as being exogenous to society, that it was, you know, an act of God, as we used to call them, well, not even in the ancient past. Uh, that it was a punishment, that it was the gods of God somehow wreaking this revenge upon humanity and you deserved it. You see this shift, uh, and then if you look at it as an exogenous phenomenon, then you can in some way control it. You can build a bigger dam, you can more concrete, more steel, better early warning, better surveillance. It's, it's something to manage. And, and we need our engineers, I acknowledge them, of course, but that's very much a technocratic approach. The paradigm shift into the Sendai framework in 2015 saw the risk of the threats, the hazards as endogenous to society, coming from within, as you say, coming from within society. Uh, how, we, how we develop, how we locate, where we locate, how we design, how we think we can control. I mean, there are, there are large cities in, this, uh, in our societies now built on floodplains. Right, Calgary, uh, 
uh, massive floods a few years ago, huge costs. Um, you know, and the idea of some people now is, okay, we just need to build a bigger dike, a bigger flood management control system. These systems are incredibly expensive and still will always be subject to failure, right? So how do we actually live alongside these hazards and these risks? So the risks come from our society, as you say, and I absolutely agree. How can we now live alongside them? It's a huge challenge. Okay, thank you for answering. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes, hello, yes. First of all, Eid Mubarak, everyone. Sir, I want to ask, what do you think about Indian indigenous community? And sir, what if one person mane, uh, shows other religion over his old religion, will that affect his indigenous city? Will this what? affect, will his uh, cultural value will, uh, sense or what? I want to well, know that. I, I don't know a lot about uh, indigenous peoples from India. I have seen some presentations uh, at a number of conferences. Uh, some insight, I have a student from, uh, well, nearby in some, some respects, Chittagong Hill Tracks, uh, and we see the same patterns of marginalization, oppression, racism, discrimination. Uh, the uh, oppression from state forces, exclusion of their traditional food gathering, uh, and environmental management techs, putting them at more risk. And so I see them as uh, likewise needing to be coming into the discussions and the debates at all levels so that they can present their concerns, the priorities that they see for hazards and risks and how they best see them managed. And sorry, I missed the second part of, of your question. Was it about how their knowledges could be integrated into this? Because they, they have a wealth of knowledge. I mean, ancient, ancient peoples have a huge amount of knowledge uh, and the insight that they can bring to contemporary discussions and, and the risks and hazards we see. I mean, to me, it's, you know, it has to happen. And I think it is happening. It's just things are happening so slowly. And the time frame for doing something is just so restricted now. Anyone next? Yeah, hi, Simon, uh, and hi, Ashraf. Uh, thank you for organizing this. And Simon, it was a great presentation, lots of new learnings. I just wanted to know if there is any global standardized uh, training module on disaster risk reduction. I don't think so. I think there's a, a, a huge variation around the world for training in this space. There, there's been a proliferation of university programs, uh, particularly at master's level, looking at, at uh, disasters. And so Lincoln University, where I did my PhD uh, in collaboration with the University of Canterbury has a master's of disasters program. I mean, the title chooses itself, I suppose. Uh, the, I mean, I think it's important to have have that academic training for some, but we do tend to see uh, a lot of ill-equipped people turning up in the front line of disasters. Um, uh, you know, if you look at events like the Haiti earthquake uh, and other events in, in the Caribbean, South and Central America, it's kind of this flooding of, of, um, of first world non-Indigenous people's very privileged people's you know, university education most society is very expensive now so these people with academic credentials ending up in the front line uh you know i know sometimes uh, the optics of that uh, can be a little poor shall we say uh but you know universal i mean i know the engineers might argue there's a universal approach to these things but i think as i mentioned in the previous answer that actually we need a range of disciplines to come in to inform this it's really a social issue we're dealing with. So we're talking about social science. We also need to change political economic structures. So it's actually quite revolutionary. 
right? It's not, not a lot of governments want to hear you doing that. So I think on the one hand, the technical training, yes, aspects of that I think can be standardized, but the broader strategy that we need is actually uh, transforming how we live collectively and individually. And that's a big call. <laughs> That's a that's a big uh, sorry, just saying uh, my my wife she's she's off to cook dinner for her for her father. So um, standardized? No, I'm always a little hesitant to say we say we should have a standardized approach to anything because there's so much variation across the world, different cultures, different peoples. Like I say, our communities are diverse. All communities are diverse. How do we have a standardized approach? to disaster reduction when we have so much diversity. I think, I think at some levels, I think we do need to come together and certainly the UN provides a framework for that. Uh, but again, how do we drill down and at what levels do we then enable and empower local voices and local approaches and have their particular tweaks to a strategy, how to implement it, how to work, who's vulnerable, how to support them and so on. So I, I'd say actually, no, I don't see a standardized approach. And I, I would argue, I don't want to see a standardized approach for those reasons. Kia ora, it's a good question. Thank you, Simon, for answering. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Pradeep, uh, i like to add something. Um, your question was regarding uh, DRR training modules. As I'm aware, India is also having very good record of uh, work on in this direction especially the work of Sphere India is very commendable work in India, which is happening with the, with the Ministry of Home Affairs. I know uh, they have a lot of resources on their website and in collaboration of many organizations like Red R. Red R is very popular organization working on disastrous relief, disaster reduction. <clears throat> Although the Red Cross is also working on it, but the Red R is very, very solid organization working on in this direction. So uh, Sphere India has uh, developed not many such resources. I think you can browse their website. So Sphere India is a global network very well known. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Asra. Thank you for this. And you know, valuable. Please, any other questions? Well, that looks like the end of it there, Dr. Hazrat. Thanks again. That was that was really enjoyable. I enjoyed I enjoyed doing that. Any any question? Any other question? Now, otherwise we can close it now. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much. Look, and and you can find our details online. You can find my contact details at the University of Saskatchewan. If anyone wants to to contact me and and carry on the conversation or. Or, uh, or talk in more detail on some of the things that perhaps we could do. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Simon and, and uh, the introducer, Mel Mark. So thank you so much for your time, attention, and a lot of work um, in the background you have already done for this lecture. So we will keep uh, in touch and I, I, th I request the audiences also to directly contact you in case they have uh, some specific things to ask you or to connect with you. So we have the series uh, of lectures during the month of May and June. So you can, anyone can um, visit the website and the website is having all the lectures listed over there. So thank you so much. And we will, we wish that uh, you people again join us during the next lectures. So thank you so much for giving time, everyone. Okay. <laughs>
Kia ora yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Hasrat. Thank you, Russell, for organizing Bye-bye. it. Thank you, Simon. Take care.